Hi everyone, I'm Martile Beatty and welcome to 12 Questions here on Crafty Link. I hope you guys are having a great week and this week I have Carolyn Woods with me and we're going to be talking with her, um, well, about her book and her creativity and also her genius way of organizing your life. Um, so I hope you're all very excited. I'm going to go ahead and put it in the chat that we are live so that all of you in the chat know this. Um, so if you have questions during the show, uh, definitely let our moderator Kira know um, by, uh, well, putting things in caps. That's going to be really helpful for us to catch any questions you have. So any questions, put them in caps. Uh, so we're going to go ahead and get started and I'm going to hand it over here to Carolyn and she's going to tell, well, tell us a little bit about herself. So all you, Carolyn. Well, sure. Thank you, Martille. Um, so my name is Carolyn Woods. I'm a professional organizer, I'm actually a member of the National Association of Professional Organizers. Um, I've had a business totally tidy household organizing for about 10 years. Um, it's not my full-time job. I organize with my clients evenings and weekends. And then I do have a full-time profession in marketing communications. And I work for a not-for-profit organization in the Phoenix area. So I've got the day job and the evening job. Um, but the organizing is really what fuels my soul. It's, it's part of who I am and something I can share with other people and help people who are less fortunate, the ones who are, are bogged down in their own clutter and who, you know, just kind of lost track of things and uh, want to get their stuff back in order because it frees their mind to do other things. So, yeah, that's, that's the organizing profession, as it were. Um, <laughs> I know, because some of us always need a little organizational help, don't we? <laughs> and as More than you know. You see behind me, you could probably guess maybe that I might um, need some organization, but it's very organized. I Trust me, it's all clipped up there in a nice, very organization, organized manner, I assure you. It um, looks great, Martile. Yes. Um, so anyway, uh, so my next question uh, is what does creative organization mean to you? Oh, that's, that's almost two opposing terms, creative organization. <laughs> what I've noticed with, um, with my clients who are crafty um, is that it's really hard for them to stay organized all at one time. So there aren't a lot of creative people that I've come across in many years of organizing who have all of their stuff put away every day, right? So you think of, okay, you know, you leave your desk at work and it's all nice and set up for the next day and your chair is pushed in and all of your stuff is filed away. That's not how it works in a studio. Um, so creative people really need to see their stuff, right? They want to feel it and touch it and think about it. Um, so it's really hard at the end of in your studio that gives you the best chance of finding the things again. So you've got a project and you know you've got that thing somewhere. So I think to be creatively organized is to be inspired by being able to, to know what you have and keep a good inventory, but also to not feel constrained within your space, but to feel like you can be productive and artistic um, but still, when you're done with the project, get the things back into a place that makes sense so that when you need them again, you can find them. I totally agree with that. Um, you know, for, for those of us who thrive in creative chaos, um, as we 
like to say. Um, you know, I, I totally understand that. And at the same time, I feel like creative block often like grows out of that chaos. And, you know, as an art coach, and someone who works with clients who are building their creative businesses, I totally get that. And you know what? You probably run into this all the time where they're feeling like totally overwhelmed by their space. Mm -hmm. um, and that's probably where the root cause of a lot of creative block occurs is that it's just too much stuff all over the place. And it, we just simply need to just put it away so that we can start fresh in the, the next day. So, um, yeah, I was interested to hear what you were going to say to that question. So, um, I'm glad. Um, yeah, I'm good, good advice. Um, okay, so the next question uh, is, can you talk about the moment when you realize that organization was something you had a gift for? Oh. I actually thought probably first of all that it was a curse. Um, <laughs> knowing, knowing that it was a gift came a, a lot later in life. I was, the, I was the kid that had all of my Barbie clothes all stacked up, layered one on another, dressed on top of the other, skirt on the others, you know, all laid out in the drawers so that I could find what I wanted. and. Um, so organization came very naturally to me, um, but I think it also, it was something that, that probably put off a couple friends along the way, right? So when the moms came in to tell us from Playdates to go ahead and pack the stuff back up, I was all over that, and you know, the other kids thought that was the worst part, was the, the packing up and putting things away. Um, I think it really came in, so when cable television started to air, um, organizational shows, and I think the first of them was Clean Sweep. It was around 2002, 2003. Um, I watched some of those TV shows and thought, wow, I, I do that naturally. Um, and I'd already done organizational projects for friends. So it was the first time I realized that there were people out there who were really the opposite of me and my organizing skills and who could benefit from it. So I started my own business. Um, my kids were very young at the time and uh, I thought, well, you know, I don't want to spend too much time away from them, especially evenings and weekends with a full-time job. Um, but I realized also that there were people who just needed the help and I was the right person to, um, to be able to share with them my skills and give them the tips and tricks and sometimes just dig them out of their chaos. So they could get started over again. So I think the gift really came, or the idea that it was a gift came when I realized um, by seeing some of the examples on TV how badly off some other people were who weren't as organized as me. That makes sense. Um, that's interesting. Um, the, it was the TV shows that made okay. you realize that. Um, it's kind of interesting how that plays such a significant role in how we see ourselves sometimes. Yeah. Um, so the next question is sort of leads into that is like uh, as you like began to see that gift I guess what kinds of rituals or routines do you have surrounding your like organizational life? <laughs> That's a good question um, because a lot of that is really what my clients end up um, missing. So a lot of times they're in the organizational state they're in because they don't have rituals or routines. Um, I have one client I'm working with right now in particular um, who just you know, it's, it's hard to tell if she really thrives on chaos or, but she seems to go from fire to fire putting them out and um, not keeping in mind what her priorities for the day were. 
Um, so she'll let her day get away from her because she'll react to um, something rather than actually um, putting that aside, you know, letting letting the fire burn out, as it were, and keeping to what she knew she wanted to do for the day. Um, I think rituals and habits, what I talk to my clients a lot about is making sure, I mean, these are basic rules, but making sure you've got a home for everything. So everything has its place, and so that's an important part of a routine and ritual. And especially with kids, you know, I learned that myself um, in telling my kids uh, about organizational practices. But really, it's stuff that you do almost without thinking. It's you open the drawer and you take out the scissors. You use the scissors wherever you're going to use them. And then you walk them back to the drawer and put them back in. Um, that's an organizational ritual is really just to put the thing back where it came from. So, and that's what my clients need the most help with, is that they don't have that spot. They don't have the place where the thing belongs. And even if they think they know where the thing belongs, if you ask the other members of the household, they don't know where, they, where it's supposed to go. So the stuff stays out. Um, so the rituals and routines, I think, are a lot about um, creating those, those practices um, and the discipline to, to clean up after yourself and to also, you know, have the kids especially clean up after themselves to a point, right? You know, not everything has to be spick and span all the time. And maybe it's just a Saturday morning or some convenient time when everybody puts the little things away that have been kind of lurking out on the countertop for too long. Um, and you just have to have to address them. I think another ritual that's really important is not just putting the things away, but also, you know, knocking things off your list and making a real um, effort to go and run your errands. Um, so whether that's, you know, you've got a couple zip brokers, broken zippers, or you've got some buttons that need to be put on. Okay, I'm talking to crafty people. Um, so it's maybe not those errands. So maybe you need some jewelry that needs to be fixed. Again, crafty people, you might be able to fix it yourselves. But let's say you can't, um, and you need to to have someone else work on it. So you need to take your your watch to a jewelry repair place, or you need to take your um, alterations to a dry cleaner. So rather than letting the things hang around because you've got the skirts hanging out of the closet because you know they need new zippers, you go ahead and you make it part of your routine every once in a while. Maybe it's a couple weekends, a month, or an evening every week where you just go and you run your errands so that those things aren't sticking around. They're not stuck in a spot. You're actually getting them taken care of. Well, I think we can all benefit from that uh, little soapbox. Absolutely. <laughs> it's like, just take, just take care of your errands. Um, just go do it. Um, well, that is, that's all you need to say. We're done with the interview. See you later. Um, <laughs> um, so, yeah, absolutely. I, I think we're all sort of guilty of that. I mean, I know I am. Like, uh, there are times when there are things that I just put off, and it's not really because it's hard, or I don't, you know, I don't even know why we do it. Like, it's not important. It's just yeah, not, it's it's top, not top of mind. Yeah. Um. So yeah. It, it makes sense. It's just like sometimes you just need to take care of it mm -hmm. um, and just make the time to do it so that it isn't like hanging on the banister or hanging yeah. on the outside of your closet or hanging on the end of your bed or wherever the heck it's like living so that you don't have to look at it every day for three weeks or however or <laughs> it's been living there um, so it can go back to its happy home wherever that is. Um, so yeah, absolutely. Uh, so we're sort of going to shift a little bit here because um, we know you're sort of like a creative person a little bit. 
Um, and we're just curious, um, what creative medium would you like to learn? Oh, I've got a, I've got a bazillion. Um, and I actually I knocked one off my list recently. So um, I've been a scrapbooker for many years. Um, you know, the real hard copy paper stuff um, at first, and then I went digital sometime around 2009. It's been digital ever since. But um, I've been the family archivist, so I've inherited both grandmothers' um, photographs, and so I've been through and organized those and made copies for people so that, so that we had multiple copies in the family. Um, and then I knew I, I wanted to do some cake decorating with my daughter, and so that was what I knocked off the list most recently. I got through um, a few cake decorating classes, and that's always been really appealing to me. So I've got a lot more to learn in um, all kinds of, I think, fondant creations I could make. So I know I've got that ahead of me. Um, but the other thing I kind of want to bite off and chew and get into, um, I've dabbled in, in some knitting and crocheting, and that's really not my thing. Um, but I would love to make my own jewelry. Um, I'm a bit of a jewelry freak, and so um, I know that, well, there's sometimes I'll, I'll buy a new outfit, and I just want the perfect piece to go with it. So why don't I just make it myself? Um, and my sister gifted to my daughter a bunch of beads, and I think I probably need to help my daughter use those. So if I learn that myself, that'll be my next creative endeavor is to to start making some of my own jewelry. Very nice. Um, uh, yeah, I think that that uh, learning to make your own jewelry is uh, definitely a good idea. Um, I tried it once, and I'm horrendous at it. So I leave it to <laughs> you. Um, the and I may be too. I won't know until I try. Who knows? You might be really, really good at it. Yeah, I um, so I have a personal obsession with earrings, and I'm like, okay. Yeah. Well, I will leave it to the lovely men and women who make these things, and I will just buy them <laughs> um, because I can't make them. I I'm terrible at them. I just, you know, people. May, I'm like, oh, that looks so easy. No, no, I. Now I cannot do it. Apparently, I do not have the dexterity or the patience for it. So, oh, um, unfortunately, I'm still in that. It looks really easy camp. So, good. I might Go find it. it's not my thing either. But uh, I know at least that I'll get a couple of pieces that I really, really like. So, good. that's what I'm going for. I, I hope it's a big success for you. Because um, <laughs> I think it is for a lot of people, but. For me, it was a total failure. So I'm I'm leaving it to the people who are good at it, um, and admitting that I I am not. <laughs> so, um, but that's okay. So I guess uh, speaking of art projects, uh, what's the first I guess art project you can remember, and why do you think it's relevant in your memory? Oh. Oh, we're gonna we're gonna time travel back. Um, <laughs> it's a long time ago. Um, I'm not sure I really knew I was any good, but I do remember this one project that stands out, and this was Mrs. Parker's seventh grade world history class. And Mrs. Parker, bless you. Um, I loved your class. <laughs> Um, I made, in that class, I made a um, two-scale rendition of Stonehenge out of clay and fake grass. And I worked so hard on that project, um, and I really tried to work with the clay in a way that reflected the actual shapes of the stones in Stonehenge. Um, I had such a great time with that, and I think it came out awesome. But then again, I was a seventh grader, and I only have distant memories of this. Um, but I think looking back, that really was one of the art projects that really inspired me and thought, wow, um, you know, I can create something from a 
big block of clay that actually looks like a historic, you know, world landmark. Um, so I was pretty proud of that, and I think that probably gave me some of the gumption to um, try other artistic endeavors. Um, so I'm I'm the one who's always ripping pages out of magazines and you know making the little tablescapes or the flower arrangements. Um, and so I'll dabble in some of the things. I'll look at a magazine and say, oh, I've got to have those napkin rings. I'll make them myself. So over the years, I've tried a lot of little projects. Some of them haven't worked out so well. Um, but I think that one Stonehenge project really made me think like, I wish I had a picture or something to share with you, but really made me think like, I can do this. Very nice. I think we all have uh, some projects like that in our past. Um, That's a very distant past. Oh well, you know, I've had uh, I've had authors who've talked about when they were six and they've learned, you know, something from an aunt, and you know, they recount that. So, hey, seventh grade—that's not that far back um, compared <laughs> to being six. The camera must not be so good; you can't tell how old I am. Yeah, well, that's okay. You're looking pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> You're looking very young and uh, spunky today. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so our our uh, next question, the set of questions, is really about your book because I know the audience really wants to know about like the organizational like aspects and really you focused on like organizational solutions for quilters mm -hmm. and um, so I'm really curious what inspired your book, Organizational Solutions for Every Quilter. Okay, well, so I, brought, I have my book with me, and so that's the book, and I think, yeah, there we go. And I think we can get that. Um, I know you guys have that on the website for the giveaway. Um, the idea came about, so to, uh, full disclosure, my sister worked for the publisher, c and Publishing, and um, she was um, working at the time as acquisitions editor, and it's we're both last name Woods, so there's no, um, there's definitely a connection there. Um, so my sister Suzanne had said, well, would you be interested in writing an organizational book for C and T? And um, I said, no, <laughs> um, I have no business writing a book. Um, so I, she worked on me, probably. Oh, she probably asked me three times. Um, and I said no, you know, just have a lot going on, and especially, you know, with a full-time job and organizing with clients evenings and weekends and children and soccer games and all those other things that we do, um, I didn't think I could manage it. Um, but she worked on my husband, too, which was kind of unfair. Um, <laughs> and so um, my sister uh, said to my husband, oh, you know, Carol would be um, great at writing a book, and Finally, she threw down the gauntlet for me, and she said, well, can't you just organize anything? And it's true. I mean, when you've got organizational skills, it's not so hard, even if you're not a quilter, to figure out what, um, how to organize things better. And I've worked with clients on all kinds of things, so I, I recognized the challenge and thought, okay, I've worked with some clients who are, um, you know, they're, they're freaks for tools. I'm talking tools like Ryobi and Makita, um, where they they just had garages full of tools, and and you know we managed to get those under control, um, and kitchens and all kinds of spaces. So I thought, well, you know, quilting supplies really can't be all that hard. Um, so knowing that my sister's a quilter and C and T Publishing focuses on quilting. Um, I started to study quilting. I really, I started, I drew out a sketch and I called it the anatomy of a quilt um, in a sketchbook that ended up being my notebook for the rest of the book. And once I had um, the terminology down, I needed to understand, you know, what parts make up the anatomy of a quilt, I was off to the races. That was that was all I needed. So I got that one page filled out for the anatomy of the quilt, and I just kept going. Um, and I, I worked through the various chapters and and really 
laid out some of the, the whole first two chapters are just basic organizing skills. It's not even, you know, it's got a, a quilting bent to it, but it's really kind of pouring out all of the um, concepts in getting organized. So you could read the first two chapters and not be a quilter either um, and really understand some of the basics of, of organizing. So it wasn't so much the inspiration as it was, I think, um, you know, having my sister challenge me in that way to write the book and then realizing I've, I've been um, a quilting aficionado for many years because it's been my sister's hobby. Um, so I felt like, okay, if I can make a difference to some people who are, as we talked about at the beginning of the interview, um, creatively, organizationally challenged, that that would be um, a good thing to, to provide people with the information. Well, that's an interesting answer to that. Um, I did not expect that at all. Um, <laughs> you know, usually people are like, well, I love quilting, so I thought I'd put it together. Um, yeah, that's a very interesting story um, on how that came together, um, that your sister is the quilter, um, mm -hmm. really. Yeah. So this is really kind of an interesting story. I love that, um, that she's the one that really was like, hey, you need to help me. Yeah. <laughs> That's great. Um, it's good when, when siblings help us achieve our goals, isn't it? And I um, should say a shout out to my sister. Thank you, Suzanne, for the opportunity. If you hadn't done it, I wouldn't have written the book. So. Yes. Good to, good to have sisters, right? I have a sister, too, so I know exactly what it's like to have a sister. <laughs> And hopefully she challenges you too. <laughs> oh, she does. Definitely. Definitely. Always. Um, so let's see here. Uh, I guess it, continuing along our organizational conversation on your book, um, what's your favorite organizational tool or container that you like to suggest or um, use? Or oh, that's an easy one. Hands down, Ziploc bags. <laughs> oh, really? so simple, so handy. Um, what a great way to to separate things. Um, and everybody has them. So I always tell my clients when we start um, a project, you know, usually you don't have to buy anything. We can just start with what you already have on hand. You know, don't go out and buy a bunch of containers because um, we really need to see what we've got. But Ziploc bags, oh my gosh. Um, talk about reasonably priced and completely useful. You know, you can see through them. They come in different sizes. Um, and, yeah, the ubiquitous plastic bag so that you can keep stuff separated and, um, you know, protect it, um, waterproof it, write on it, freeze it, whatever you need to do with, with the stuff in the bag. It's... Um, Totally useful. So that would be, that's my number one organizing supply. And a Sharpie. Awesome. Yeah, I um, use those a lot, actually. Mm -hmm. um, excellent. Uh, yeah. The block bags. Were you expecting? I, mean, I was expecting something like more complex, I guess. <laughs> Um, she's going to be like, I have this fabulous tool. Um, no. Don't what works. And she's like, a Ziploc bag. That's it. <laughs> I'm like, oh, that's it? Like, that's so simple. Yeah, talk um, to an organizer. They're terribly practical. Uh, I'm learning this. I'm, I'm learning how practical and simple this stuff is. Um, I have a Sharpie and a whole... <laughs> stack of bags in my closet, which I use for that very purpose. I think I might have, you know, some organizing genetics um, in the background. I want to be organized. Um, maybe. Maybe not. <laughs> I don't know. Um, okay, so... Uh, this is our advice question, and this is for you, audience. Um... So what advice can you share with our audience who are, well, a little on the cluttered or disorganized side? 
I'm sure you don't have any. No, none of them are are, are disorganized or cluttered, but for those who may feel that they are. Okay, so we'll talk theoretically. In case anyone listening is slightly cluttered or partially disorganized. Right. Um, I think the best advice is really to start small. Um, I think a lot of people, in fact I know, I know a lot of people put off organizing until it becomes um, uh, inescapable like you're having guests come stay in the house and you just got to get it cleaned up because because your mother's coming for Christmas or um, you know somebody in the family has said they can't stand it anymore you need to do something about the clutter I think really it's about um, if you can take care of some things early on and keep the problems from getting bigger then you don't get into that position where you're the organizing is inescapable and it's a horrific mess that is really intimidating. Um, you know, some people walk into rooms of their houses that are that are disorganized and their stomach sinks and they feel bad. Um, and they, you know, they worry about it. It, it makes them anxious. Um, so I think you should walk into a space and um, feel like it's home. It should be a place where you want to escape and especially if it's your craft room you want to be creative in there. You don't want to be bound by these bad feelings to where your stuff piled up. Um, but the way to tackle that is really to start with something small and to feel successful in just a drawer or just a box um, and really keep yourself, you know, limit your focus and, and don't get distracted by other things and all you have to do is look in that drawer and decide what belongs there and what doesn't um, and find things that should go in the drawer with those things. Um, so it's, it's a bit of a sorting exercise so you decide what you want in that drawer let's say because you want it to be convenient um, so what else would you put in that drawer because that drawer is so close to your work table? Um, and so you think about what should be in that drawer and you work through the drawer with that vision in mind of how you can be more efficient with the drawer and you just go through and you sort it out and you throw away or give away or move the things that don't belong there and you bring in the items that are somewhere else that you'd like to have in the drawer to make it more convenient next time. You'll have to do a little remembering about what you did in the drawer and you'll probably have a little bit of homework. You'll probably have to take the things that you didn't put back into the drawer and find new homes for those. And that's how organizing jobs spread, right? That's how you can move to your next area by saying, okay, it's the stuff left over to the drawer from the drawer, now I need to put it somewhere else. Um, but I think if you just keep it small and when you're successful, you'll feel good about that little space that you organized and you can move on to something bigger or you can just move on to the next thing, wherever that is, and be successful in one more spot. So for quilters, it's usually their stash and sometimes it's just as simple as going through your fabric stash and re-folding. Um, it can make a huge difference how your fabric stash looks when your fabric is folded well and you can see the pieces you have. Um, and I know creative people and they, they like to see and touch what it is that they have so it's a great way to get yourself back in touch with, you know, to remind yourself what you've already bought before um, all of the things that you have and really the inventory that you're working with for your supplies. So getting organized can have some side benefits and, and prevent you maybe from um, spending more money or buying something twice, but buying it for the third time. Um, something that, uh, um, you know, and you'll feel successful in the space and not come in with that, that anxiety. Um, but if you really need some extra help, bring in a friend to work with you. Hire a professional organizer, but find somebody um, that can keep you motivated and, um, you know, reward you, take you out for an ice cream when you're done with it. 
and reward yourself for your, your progress. But most of all, get started on being organized, even if it's just a couple of drawers at a time. I totally agree. And, you know, I, as I was listening to you, I was thinking about, you know, how often um, I hear my clients say, you know, how overwhelmed they feel by their creative spaces yeah. when they're cluttered. And, you know, they're like, it's disorganized, and it goes all the way back to that creative block. It goes back to feeling uninspired. It goes back to like basically not doing, not moving forward with their businesses, not moving forward with creating, not moving forward with anything that they're doing. That's because right. They walk into this space and it's like a giant explosion of anxiety and like tension and all of that. And you talk, like you absolutely hit the nail on the head about it. That is exactly what is happening with them when they walk into those spaces that are supposed to be calm and inviting and instead of it being organized and like a space that feels you know not necessarily calm but just like peaceful for them yeah. it becomes just chaotic and you know I realize that like some artists think that that like creative chaos is the way they should function but honestly I think that there are very very few artists that function like effectively under that kind of like like atmosphere yeah and I think you can have your project all spread out for a long time right, right? so you can see all of the colors that you have available to you you can see all of your materials um, and that may actually be the creative process you need is to be able to see everything and, and pull items when you think that you need them. But if you've moved on and you're working in another medium or um, another whole set of supplies, what's left from the previous project, you know, out and visual becomes clutter and it's not useful in the creative process anymore. So, you know, spread out, use all of your surfaces, you know, use the floors and walls like artists do. Um, but when you're done with that thing, make sure it goes back into a home so that you can find it again and then spread out again with your next project. Right, right. Um, absolutely. And I hope our audience, if you have questions about, you know, like maybe organizing something in your, your space that you're having trouble with, you know, we'll have a Q&A session um, here in a few minutes. Probably we have a few more questions to cover. So feel free to leave um, your questions in the chat in all caps so that um, we can uh, give some, some questions to Carolyn here at the end because we're going to have a book giveaway here in a few minutes. And then um, you guys can answer. Ask her some uh, organizational questions about your spaces. Um, if you have some trouble areas that you'd like to, uh, I don't know, pick her brain about. Please do. <laughs> so, okay, so really, you sort of have answered this question a little bit, but I guess maybe you can expand on it a little bit more. Um, and it's why is quilting important to you? And you kind of talked about that a little bit with your sister, um, but maybe you can tell us a little bit more about that. Yeah, well, it's it's something, it's an art I've admired for many years. And, you know, quilting in my family, especially with my sister as the quilt maker, um, she has made her quilts that coincide with family events. So I have quilts um, that she's made um, one for my wedding, uh, one from each kid, um, and a couple of other special occasions in between. And um, in fact, in my office, um, I have a series of quilts that she made, um, Japanese fabric quilts, and I get compliments on them daily. Um, and I stare at them when I'm on the phone at work, and they are my inspiration as well. And so you know how many times I've studied those Japanese fabrics that hang on the wall 
Um, but quilting is such a beautiful medium, and how you can take just this flat fabric and turn it into something so visual is an incredible art to me. Um, my sister has passed it down to my daughter. Um, so my daughter, who is 12, is also now um, a self-declared quilter. And um, even yesterday, uh, so she's on her fall break right now, and yesterday she was texting me pictures of her blocks um, to make sure that her measurements were right. So that's a little hard because right now I'm sitting in a hotel in Chicago and she's back home in Arizona. So we did our, our little FaceTime meeting um, to talk about her measurements in one of my breaks here at this conference I'm at. Um, but in any case, uh, it's, it's nice to have that. You know, you said, Martiel, when you have um, people talk about you know, learning something from their aunt or passed down, down through the generations. It's nice to see it from my sister to my daughter. Um, and although I'm not a quilter, you know, I'm still the mom of a 12-year-old. So, you know, she can't go buy her own fabric on her own and she needs the help with the designs. And guess who cuts out a lot of the um, fabric pieces? Um, so, so I might actually fall more into the category of a creative quilting coach, um, even though I'm not doing the quilting myself, at least for my, my daughter in the household. Um, but it's been a nice group of people to meet. Uh, I know that you've got people who tune into Crafty Link for lots of other crafts, and you know I wouldn't say that um, anybody in the quilting community, community doesn't do other things too. Um, but I think that quilting is something, I always thought it was really just about making bedspreads. And I, until I got really behind the scenes with the quilting community to write the book, I didn't appreciate even all of the fabric art um, that I see now. And taking me to a quilt show, I'm like a kid in a candy store. Um, I love it so much to see and appreciate other people's work and their creativity. Um, I don't always wish it was mine because I know that sometimes years go into making those quilts. Um, and I'm probably not that patient of a person, so I'd rather admire something that somebody else did. Um, so I feel like I, with this book especially, I, you know, I talked to um, about a dozen quilters in the Phoenix area who opened up their homes and opened up their studios to me. and answered a lot of questions I had, not only about their stuff, because I needed to look at it from an organizer's perspective, but also about the art of quilting. And they taught me a lot. They, they not only taught me the lingo, but I think that they really deepened my appreciation um, for the art. And I got this wonderful behind-the-scenes look um, that I wouldn't have otherwise had without writing this book. So I'm very grateful and um, if nothing else then I know I also appreciate um, even more my sister's quilts that she's gifted to me over the years. Um, so it's a it's a beautiful it's a beautiful art form and uh, it'll always be a part of my life. That's really um, it's really amazing that you know through your sister, you have like experienced such a transformation, um, you know, and that your daughter has like it's kind of like skipped yeah. you, but right. that she that she's taking that up, um, you know, like in it's kind of funny, but it's kind of happened that way with my it, like my mom. She is a very very gifted seamstress. Skipped my sister. <laughs> like, totally skipped her. Like, she's like, I have no idea what I'm doing. Um, she can barely sew on a button. Um, but for me, like, I do silk screen. I, you know, I, I can sew just about anything. Crochet, like, you know, like, all of it. Yeah. And it's really interesting how that, that happens. Um... And so I'm really glad that you can be a part of that with your daughter and like experience that kind of with her and kind of take that journey and 
that's um, that's a really special experience. Um, so I am so excited for you. <laughs> like, kind of like getting a little teary eyed that you get oh. to. Oh. Um, so anyway, um, but that's really, really, um, that's really special that you get to do that um, because not a lot of people like get that opportunity um, to experience like the arts in that way mm -hmm. and you know and get to then because I think a lot of people either fall in love with creativity or they don't yeah and you've had like almost a second chance and you've discovered it in a way that most people don't and yes. And I, I agree with you. And being able to pass that on to you know the next generation um, has been a lot of fun. And to see my daughter flourish and you know cake decorating because we did those classes together, um, and uh, you know to see her on the school breaks, um, walking away from academics and picking up a needle is is so right. I feel like I'm getting her left brain and her right brain. Um, in sync, and so for me as a as a parent as well, it's great to see um, you know my sister's creativity rub off my daughter. I'd love to say some of it was mine too, but um, uh, in any case, to be able to to support what she does, and you know I might sit off to the side and do some scrapbooking with her, but to see her really flourish in a way um, that you know she wouldn't have otherwise had if quilting wasn't such a big part of our family. Right, right. Well, um, well, maybe at some point you can uh, share some photos of something that she makes. We'd love to see it. Um, that would be really great. So um, we're going to kind of uh, switch gears again on you. And so your book has a lot of stuff in it. Um, and as uh, you shared with me, you can kind of get a preview of your book on Google, the first mm -hmm. chapter. You yes. Can see the first chapter on Google. So for those of you who are interested in previewing Carolyn's book, you can check it out on Google and um, see what she can. Um, if you're interested in buying her book, you can get like a little preview and see what it's all about. But um, we're kind of interested to hear, is there anything that you really wanted to include in the book? Um, like maybe one tip or trick um, you wanted to include that you, that didn't make it in? That you can um, I was going to talk in the book um, a lot more about color matching um, mm, okay. for organizing a stash, and we decided not to go into um, you know some of the basics of understanding colorways. Um, but I also decided that really that if you are going to buy a book on organizing, you need to just start with a really basic level, like what organizing means. So actually trying to organize your stash um, completely by hue was not going to work out so well for some beginning organizers. Um, so even just getting your stash together in one place, I thought, would probably be the challenge that you needed to overcome. Um, but I think there's a lot, especially for quilters where fabric is the main medium, um, having being able to find everything that you want and so that you can use it when you've already purchased it. So there's a big difference between fabrics that you can pull out of your stash and fabrics that you need to go shopping for and spend more money on. So the more chances you have of finding a color match in your stash, um, you know, the faster it is that you can get to the great new fabrics in the new, you know, fall lines. Um, uh, because you can use up some of your old things. So that was a level of detail in the book that I had considered, um, and there are a couple of, of really good, um, there's a book out there, and I'm trying to, Piegler, Maria Piegler, I think is her name, um, on Color Mastery, I think is the title of her book, um, 
And so I was going to see if Maria would even let me republish some of her information because I thought her book was so fantastic. Um, but decided against that, that it was really just a little bit too granular. Um, but I think as well, you know, it's it's a niche book, right? I wrote it for quilters specifically, so it's it's got um, quilting and sewing information all the way throughout. And, you know, I from time to time in each of the chapters, I'll talk about using a certain organizing principle for another part of your house and getting that organized as well. So there's a lot of hints and tips for doing a bathroom or for doing a home office um, that obviously aren't in the book because it's specifically about a craft room. They would still relate, but some of those tools and and um, uh, organizational standards that I would implement with a client in another part of the home obviously didn't make it into the book because it's really focused on crafting. Gotcha. Well, um, so we have one last question, and this is the uh, the most important question, of course, of sure. the entire interview. So for those of you in the audience, make sure you pay very attention, because this is the most important question ever. <laughs> um, <laughs> if you could be any organizational container, what shape or type would you be and why? <laughs> oh. <laughs> yeah. We really need to know. Um and here I am. I'm little miss practicality. So I have to say it wouldn't be anything fancy. Um I'm just going to be a, a plain old plastic tub. Let me <laughs> Let me see if I can find this for you. She even has a visual aid. Okay. Here we go. Let me see if I can get that on the video. So we're on page 53. If you guys can see that, does it come across, Martiel? It's a, it's just a plain old plastic tub. Um, that's probably a 64 quart container. Um, <laughs> It's the easiest container to find it at, at um, you know big box stores, Target or Walmart. Um, but they are so darn practical, just like me. Um, yeah. Okay, so if I, I could take that a little bit further, I would be transparent, um, right? Because you always want to be a transparent person, um, mm -hmm. and you want your containers to be transparent too, so that you can see what's inside of them. Um, when you can't see what's inside, I think you lose track that you had it in the first place. Um, you know, I guess that would make me weatherproof as well. Um, <laughs> so you could put me in a dusty place, and you could put me in a wet place or a damp place, and my contents would still be dry. Um, but I think, uh, and that would also make me very affordable if I were a container. So to put me in the 64 quart bin, and I'm talking your typical, um, you know, Rubbermaid or Sterilite container, um, mm -hmm. with a good fitting lid. Pass it. There are a few models out there, even from Rubbermaid and Sterilite, whose lids don't fit well. Pick one that does. Um, and you could stack me, and you could, um, you know, beat me up a little bit, and I'd still look okay. Um, but yeah, I would be a plain old useful plastic tub that would look good anywhere in your house. You could put me anywhere and I'd look good. So I think that's what I'd want to be. Nice. Very, very nice. And you were hoping for something fancy, weren't you? Uh, I, I didn't know what I was going to get with that question, but um, I knew you were going to have visual aid. Um, yeah, that, that's just fantastic. If I had a tub, if I weren't if I weren't in a hotel right now, I would have the tub and I'd I'd show you that. But uh, yeah, it's um just simple, easy, you know, seven bucks, and uh, and you can use it for all kinds of things. Even later when you change your mind and your projects all change too, your container is still going to be just as useful. Awesome, I love it. I love it. I uh. Clear plastic tub. Yeah, <laughs> that's that's a new one. Um, yeah, 
So, uh, so that basically wraps up our interview. Uh, so, for those of you in our audience, I uh, take a few moments if you have any outstanding questions to put them in all caps, so that I can make sure to see them. Um, because we're going to do a Q and A session here in a couple minutes, and. But first, we are going to do the drawing for the signed copy of your book. Oh, yes. Yes. So I'll probably do this one. I'll sign it for the lucky winner and ship it off. Right. Right. And um, the winner, let's see here. I wrote it down, and it's here somewhere. So are you rolling a drum? Oh, should we? Um, okay, so the winner is Lisa Berry. Um, congratulations, Lisa. Yay! Um, and you, uh, Lisa Berry is the winner. Um, L E S A Berry. Um, and I'll give you all her information after the interview. Congratulations, Lisa. I look forward to you uh, reading my book. Yay! Um, so, congratulations, Lisa, on signed copy of Carolyn's book. <laughs> uh, so, she will send it out to you very soon. Yep. Um, uh, and she'll sign it, of course. And. So, do we have any last-minute questions in the chat that I missed? Um, make sure you guys pop those in there. And uh, so, I have two questions so far, and if any more come in, I will will go to those. So, the first one is: Are you thinking of writing another book for more advanced organization? Like techniques on on quilting, I'm assuming. Did she freeze? I think we have temporarily lost Carolyn, who will be right back. Um, so just hang tight, everybody. Looks like we're having a few technical glitches here. And then um, we will, uh, for the rest of uh, rest of you. Um, if you guys have any other questions, as soon as Carolyn returns, we will get your answers, get your questions answered. So just hang tight, everyone, and hopefully she'll be back real quick. As far as um, Carolyn's book, we will be putting a link um, up on the blog very soon um, today uh, so that you guys can learn a little bit more about Carolyn as well as a link to where you can purchase her book, uh, Organizing Solutions for Every Quilter. Uh, we will also um, be putting a link to her website and um, any other information so that you guys can follow her and connect with her because she has a lot of tips and tricks um, available online so that you can um, I, well work on your organizing solutions as well. So uh, if you have questions after the interview today, you are welcome to always um, post questions below in this discussion thread and uh, 
and we'll answer the questions. If they're specific for for Carolyn, uh, we will pass them along to her and let her know that there's a question for her and and get the question answered for you as soon as we can. Uh, and I'm not sure Carolyn's going to be able to come back. So with the two questions we had were, are you thinking of writing another book for more advanced organization? And do you offer classes on online organizational classes? So for those of you who don't live near her, who don't live in Arizona, and would like to take classes on being more organized or organizing your studios, um, We'll get those questions answered, and hopefully um, we'll be able to do that today. So uh, I'm going to go ahead and sign off and sit, tell you guys have a great day. If you have additional questions, make sure you leave them below this discussion th thread. Stumbling over my words today. Sorry, guys. And uh, we'll be back uh, later on this month. Kira will be doing a uh, interview with uh, Christy Friesen for the uh, Create Along Challenge that happens monthly. So definitely tune in for that. And maybe she can pop in. Um, Maybe she could pop the date of that uh, in the discussion th into the chat room there uh, so you all can see the date for that. And we'll see you all again soon. Have a great day, everybody.